welcome. My name is Leslie here at the Addison Public Library, and today we're excited to be talking to some members of SCARES, one of the newest organizations in Addison. Ladies, can you go ahead and introduce yourselves? Sure. My name is Kay McKean, and I am the founder of SCARES. My name is Beverly Jazarowski, and I am the COO of SCARES and the daughter of Kay McKean. Thank you both so much for joining us today. We're so excited to learn a little bit more about you as well as SCARES. So we've said SCARES a few times. Can you tell us what that acronym stands for? Isn't that just a terrible name? <laughs> it had, it's an acronym, yes. S and C School Community Assistance for Recycling and Composting Education. And it really, um, it was a name that had to cover a lot of things because we had state contracts and county contracts and so we want to include everybody. So it's kind of a long name, but scarce is um, also important for our work. Books are scarce for kids all over the world. Um, resources are becoming more scarce. Clean water is more scarce. So besides that, um, it is our acronym. It's, it's kind of who we are and what we try to do and what, how we try to help. So we've You've talked a little bit about now, but can you tell us a little bit more about your missions, initiatives, and the many different operations that make up what SCARES is? <laughs> well, when you say many, um, <laughs> there are many. <laughs> we, we really, we care about kids. Um, and so in that, we try to help people take care of the planet. So we teach teachers and we teach garden clubs and park districts and your library earned our county earth flag. And um, so we try to teach so that people can make better choices about taking care of the planet. Or if we don't know, now we can know. So how to recycle better, how to conserve water, how to uh, reduce our air pollution, those kinds of things. Uh, but so we teach a lot because we want kids to have a healthy future. Uh, and then knowing that strong communities, of course, are going to have be healthier. We work really hard to rescue resources. We know teachers don't have all the resources that they need. And we know that there are kids at home who don't have all the resources that they need. So when we rescue perfectly good books or student desks or saxophones, whatever it is, um, our goal is to get it to kids and um, if we build, you know, if we can help take care of each other, we take care of the planet at the same time. So that's what we do. We teach and we rescue resources. And, and I hope that people learn from us that we that little things add up. So if you do a better job putting your stuff in the recycling bin and so does your neighbor, then that helps make the recycling uh, system safer and um, uh, we protect more resources that way. So we're all about protecting people, planet, kids. That's what we do. <laughs> What am I leaving out, Bev? No, just that, you know, when you do all those things, it is a healthier community and it, it helps kids. So it's not only about the environment, it's all of it put together. That's great. And I, I've been to your center, so you really do provide a cohesive experience, <laughs> all aspects of that. Um, so speaking of your center, you moved to Addison in 2020. What made you choose Addison as your new home? So one of the things is, you know, I think Kay mentioned already, we have a good relationship with the school district. We have a great relationship um, with the band director at the middle school, um, the library, the park district, you know, um, the county board members, even from Addison. We have a really good foundation here. We have a lot of uh, companies that are very supportive of us. The ReStore is kind of like a uh, great place to be across the street from because we have like-minded people going there. Uh, so we really like partnering with them and the location is unbeatable really for us. Um, so we, we really wanted to be here. And, you know, Beverly and Heather and Lynette and Valerie and our board, they looked at, I think, 37 locations around DuPage County. Yeah. And this just seemed like so perfect for us because we were on Roosevelt in 53 before in Glen Ellen. So we're still on 53 and, um, we, we had an, it was a very old building we were in and now to have 90 feet of windows um, is uh, amazing. Like right now we're plant sitting several people's plants because they went away to Florida, but you can't beat 90 feet of east facing windows <laughs> for plants. So um, plants are good for us, good for our air and you know, everything. So we're plant sitting, but 
it, it was just it was just a, a really perfect location. And out of 37, 37 facilities they looked at, um, you know, we're on a big road, but we're not like um, in a ring. It's not noisy. It's just it's just everything. And for me, I'm getting a little older and I love that there's no stairs here. And uh, Bev's right, you know, we work a lot with Domtar just down the street and Earth Friendly Products and what is it, World Cube, Bev? I always say it wrong. Whole, whole Cube. Whole Cube, Whole Cube, Whole Cube. Yeah. Um, so we're really grateful for that. And she's right, the ReStore being across the street, it, it's, just, it's just perfect for us. And these are relationships we had even prior to moving here, you know, so it just it felt good to just be by these people. Just in case someone doesn't know, can you tell us where you're located in Addison? Sure. 800 South Raleigh Roads. We're, you know, just shy of being uh, in Lombard. So we're like, it's right there, but um, just north of North Avenue. Perfect. And I think the interview before us, we talked to the learning experience. You guys are like right next door. So yeah. Two brand new people right next to each other. So if you hadn't noticed, we mentioned you came to us in 2020. So you moved amidst of a pandemic. What that had to be challenging. What was that experience like for your team? So luckily, uh, the bulk of the move took place the day before the governor enforced the lockdown. <laughs> so we um, used the Sheriff's Work Alternative Program uh, from DuPage County. Yeah, and they, they boxed everything up in Glen Ellen and Heather and I drove two 26 foot trucks 56 times between Glen Ellen and Addison with full trucks of shelving and books and supplies. And then the swap guys unloaded it and put it all together. And we still had a few things uh, in Glen Ellen. And then that Friday, the governor said five o'clock tomorrow, you have to stay home. And we were like, ah, so we went to Glen Ellen and we just loaded everybody we knew's pickup truck and minivan and brought it all here. And then that was it. It, it took, it took over three weeks to move. Yeah. It took yeah. over three weeks. And so without swap, I don't know what we would have done, but the sheriff's work alternative program, like Bev said, had a team in Glen Ellen and then a team here. So they were taking things apart and boxing them there, loading the truck, got them here, unloaded the truck. It was, it was actually quite amazing. Bev and Heather did a great job coordinating, organizing, all of that. But, you know, we didn't know a month before when we signed the lease <laughs> that know. there was going to be a pandemic. And um, thank goodness we had some volunteers who are retired teachers and they really know how to instruct people how to load the boxes, how to save all the little parts to the shelving units and keep them together. And then we're here at this end, there was people to help them reconstruct the shelving units. So we certainly were not all put back together, um, but really a tremendous amount of the work was done by the SWAP folks. And uh, they even had some guys, we had some rooms that we wanted a fresh coat of paint on. They did our bathrooms and they did the kitchen. And so it was a huge team effort. A lot of our regular volunteers, our staff and the SWAP folks, in fact, um, one of the deputies with the SWAP program, he said, when we were all moved in, uh, when everything was unloaded, I guess I should say, he said, you know, if I had not moved you myself, I would not believe that all of this stuff was in Glen Ellen. So <laughs> we were full to the rafters in Glen Ellen and we really needed more space. So we had 7,000 square feet. Now we've got 18,900 square feet. So it, it, it was just perfect. This is exactly what we needed to be doing, Leslie. It was perfect. It's, it's sort of a, I suppose, a blessing in disguise. So once there was the pandemic, you know, and we couldn't really open. I mean, we were planning on being open that weekend. I don't know what we were thinking. We were still in box. <laughs> but we were like, we've got to help teachers. <laughs> so, um, you know, we were able to organize because it was just my mom and my dad and myself here. Occasionally, one other staff person would come in, but we were trying to be extra safe, you know, because the governor said stay home. We were like, well, we've got these teachers who need supplies, so we'll see what we can do. But um, it did give us some time to get organized um, during that two weeks where we were really like shut down. That sounds like an ordeal without a pandemic. So I think that is <laughs> very impressive that you're able to get that all done and make it all um, 
work. So we are in 2021 now and looking ahead, do you have any upcoming plans, events that you'd like to talk about that you're excited about? Yeah, we've got two, um, two kinds of things. You guys, um, the village of Addison helped us with a ribbon cutting, which was wonderful, which we did outside due to the pandemic. <laughs> uh, we did take some quick little tours inside of the building in small groups because, you know, really last March and April and so forth, nobody really knew this was going to last so long or be so scary. And now so many different strains of the virus, you know, nobody knew. So we were really, really careful, but um, we didn't get to have a grand a really grand opening. Our 30th anniversary was in August and our board and our team, we were kind of hoping, but August was not safe to have a grand opening. And um, so April 17th, we um, kind of celebrating uh, our 30th year, but also celebrating Earth Day, the 51st Earth Day um, this year, April 22nd. So the 17th is a Saturday and we were thinking Maybe we could do small little family tours or small group tours. And uh, we're not sure, but that's that's something that we're hoping very soon to be able to announce small tours here. And then in May, Bev, we've got. Uh, oh, so we have the Get Your Garden Growing Green event. I think it might be, if we don't count last year, our sixth. Yes. Sixth one. So um, it's outside. It always has been, but last year we just couldn't gather with the crowds, but. Um, it's organic seedlings, native plants. Um, we have a lady who brings backyard chickens, you know, um, last two years ago, we had a guy bringing goats. Um, we sell, we don't sell, but vendors come and they sell, you know, some kind of earth friendly products. And then we do little, I don't know how we'll do it this year with the pandemic. Um, but we've always done little seminars. So a beekeeper comes and talks about backyard beekeeping, uh, we do a composting seminar and it's just free and open to the public. And it's really about trying to um, start a garden or care for your land around your home in an organic sort of way. We sell uh, food scrap amended compost, which uh, is the best for your yard, whether you're planting a tree or tomatoes or whatever it is. And um, so we want to teach people about taking care of their yard uh, organically, safely, and, uh, and then sell some products, um, you know, that they can use in their yard. I think we're trying to give people an overview, you know, that managing water in your yard, native plants are drought resistant, native plants have deeper roots, so they can help send stormwater, you know, down um, back to the aquifers, trying to promote reuse, even more importantly than recycling. So there's a lot going on in that day. And again, we're hoping to have that, that Saturday, April 1st, um, again, well, I, May 1st, May 1st, did I say April? Yeah. May 1st, May 1st, sorry. And we're hoping that um, being right on Route 53, people will see our displays and exhibits. And I, and I think it could be a real nice family day or individual day. So that's what we're hoping for. We're crossing our fingers for some good virus news maybe by then a lot more people will be vaccinated. Oh, that sounds fascinating. I wanted to put that in my book. Um, my <laughs> uncle's a landscape architect and he owns a oh. tree nursery. So, and they have natural prairie in their front yard. So they burn it every year. So I've grown up around a lot of that. So I was oh, like, maybe he can help us with a workshop sometime. <laughs> I, don't see, I don't know. He may get angry that I've offered him up for stuff. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, as you alluded to, this answer might be a little different than we originally thought. Um, what inspired you to work for SCARES? How have you, have you always been this passionate about helping the environment? You know, I, I am a really lucky person. Um, both of our grandmothers lived with me as a kid growing up and they both, nobody talked about being an environmentalist then, but they didn't waste anything. And my one grandmother would go out and she'd, look at the little buds on the apple tree and say, these flowers will open in two days. And they opened in two days. <laughs> and my other grandmother, she, you know how people say, oh, there's a bird. She would say, there's a female cardinal. There's a male this, there's, you know. And so you knew that there was such a difference in, in the wildlife and she knew all the butterfly names. And so you, you didn't just say there's a tree, you know, there's a red oak, you know, and so 
I was really lucky growing up with people who didn't waste. And my dad, um, there are trees, and you know, my dad died very, very young, but there are um, trees all over that my dad planted because he said, these trees will be here long after he's gone and I'm gone and so forth. And you drive by one of our houses that we lived in as kids and there's those trees that we planted in 1959 and there's this. And so I, I really was a very lucky person to grow up caring and we would camp a lot and take walks in the woods. We were not like, we didn't go to theme parks or anything like that. That's not really who we were, but we took a lot of walks and forests and prairies and things. And you had to pick up litter, even if it wasn't your litter, you, you had to leave it better than it was. It was just kind of, I just lucked out growing up like that. And poor Beverly, she's, she's had to, <laughs> it's been her entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Not poor Beverly. <laughs> No, I mean, so part of the reason I really like working here is um, prior to working here, I was a social worker. And so taking care of kids is what I did. Kids from, you know, not great homes and in foster care and things like that. And um, giving them a book here, knowing that the kids I cared for, they didn't have books and maybe their parents didn't have books. And so it's kind of like this cycle and um, we know that if you have books in your home, um, there's a certain number of books in your home, you will, you know, make it to the eighth grade. And if you have even more books in your home, you will graduate high school. And if you have even more books in your home, you might go on to that secondary education, like associate's degree or trade school or something. And it starts with that book. So the kids that I helped, if their parents never had books in their house, you know, how do you break this cycle? It's, and it's more than just a bandaid because it's a thing that builds and um, it's education and it's having something that is yours and it's a book. And um, so for me, it's, it, it's a different kind of social work. Um, and I think it helps with that cycle. That's great. Um, so you guys both said this a little bit, but what's the, your favorite part of your job? <laughs> oh my goodness. I could be here seven or eight days a week. Okay, Leslie. <laughs> when a teacher is like, oh my gosh, they just found the perfect book for a, a particular child. Uh, you know, we get goosebumps around here a lot. Um, the the garden that we got to help at the jail and getting to be there when people who are incarcerated come out and they're in the sunshine and they're touching soil and they're seeing how big sunflower plants really can be. Um, they're working with lead free garden hoses. Uh, you know, all of that is, it, it's just, um, it's goose bumpy. It's important. Um, I, there, I love, I love all of it. Just all of it. I love the idea that um, kids can take some of this with them. They might take it home or a parent is gonna hear about it at a Rotary Club meeting or Kiwanis meeting or a business lunch or whatever and then and bring that home. I love the ripple effect. That's our newsletter through DuPage County is called Ripples for Teachers and People Who Work With Kids and the ripple effect, you know, drop a pebble in the pond, see the ripples go on and on. I, I really think, um, I, I enjoy just imagining that, you know, we've gotten books and musical instruments, school supplies to every state in our country and 105 other countries. So after natural disasters, um, whether it's a tor tornado here in Coal City or it's something in Puerto Rico, um, North Carolina, wherever the natural disasters are, uh, UPS has been a great partner to us and for us. Um, so that ripple effect is, is really profound to me. That's maybe the most important thing to me. Bev, do you have something different? Well, the variety, it is never dull at scarce. <laughs> we are never bored. There is always something happening. And I think that um, we're helping people, kids, adults, and everybody here really loves what we do. And, um, and that just makes it so joyful to come to work because we are helping people and people are happy. Uh, our staff is happy. The people who come here are happy. The kids who get books, we worked with the Northern Illinois Food Bank 
um, and uh, some other partners in Elgin two summers ago, and they were giving out food during the summer and we were giving out books. And it was just like this perfect partnership of food and books. And it really helped build in this one neighborhood in particular, a, a sense of community that they did not have before we partnered with them. It's one thing to get a sandwich and go back to your apartment, but we gave them a book and they were staying around to look at the book at the picnic table or by a tree. And it, it made this sense of community that they didn't have without that book. They had food there every summer. Um, and so it's just, it's powerful. And little things add up is like the thing she says, ripples, love the ripples. But I think little things, you do one little thing and it adds up to help somebody. You know, Leslie, um, you guys had our exhibit where is away at the library. And um, one of your um, participants at the library saw that and his name's Mike and he's an Addison resident and he saw that and he knew he wanted to volunteer for us just for what Bev just said the little things adding up. He just think he he cannot stand waste. And so um, he came to check us out after seeing that exhibit and right now, of course, you know, until people get two vaccines and stuff he's not in but um, Mike just, he learned so much from the exhibit. So that's so bad. Yeah. The little things adding up that really helps people, but you know, books, you guys, of course, the library, but we helped the school district with the literacy at the laundromat project here. And I think there's three laundromats. And, uh, so yeah, be, being able to have books and reading books is really important to us as it is to you guys. huh? <laughs> I love that. I think you, <laughs> speaking, you're speaking our language, right? Exactly yeah. Not only books, but it's the little things. It's the small things every day. I mean, I also loved you mentioned UPS. They're the biggest employer in Addison. So not only do they keep our community working, yeah. but they're doing great things. So yeah, you're speaking the same language as everyone we've interviewed. I don't care whether it's the real estate agent or yeah. the fire department, but it's all about helping people. I, I agree. It speaks a lot to our community. So it's, it's, it's a nice place. It's a great place to work. Mm -hmm. and we're all very lucky. Um, so I think the next question is the hardest one, but that's just me. Um, what does an average day of work look like for you? <laughs> well, one thing I can tell you is we get our 10,000 steps usually by 11 in the morning. <laughs> Because you're ring, there's a doorbell at the back door when people are coming to drop off, and then you're going to the studio to do a program, and then you're going to the education center to prepare for a class. And we do a lot of walking here, so um, there's doorbells and there's and there's um, phone calls and emails. We, and we are stop by busy. with stuff. You know, people stop yeah. by and say, "Oh, I, you know, I brought you this," and oh, we didn't know this is coming, but great. <laughs> stop what we're doing. You know, and uh, we unload a van or do something. And so um, it's very busy uh, and it's it's different every day. There is no average day here, except that you will be busy. Yeah, that's what you should know. <laughs> and I think I think like we have this little resale area for books and records. And that's constantly bringing in um, just people who just see a sign that say books or they found it on bookfinders.com. And then they want to know about what we're doing. So then we give them a tour to say, this is how we help teachers. This is how we help kids. This is how we help, um, you know, orchestra and band teachers in schools, you know, so people like being part of the solution. And um, so they're fascinated with a quick little tour, but a quick little tour we just decided is at least 20 minutes here. So <laughs> you can only give. <laughs> I, I laugh. I had a former coworker. Her daughter suddenly got a job as a kindergarten teacher a week before school was supposed to start. So she put on Facebook, oh, where yeah. do I get supplies? And by the time I got to it, she, I said, oh, scarce. You got to go to scarce. She's like, seven people already told me that. That's, of course, that's what we have. <laughs> so just, the word is out about what you do. And I can see why you're busy. You know, a lot of schools have supplies for teachers, which is wonderful. But, you know, you've always got that child who needs a little something different or you, you want to supplement what you have with, you know, just a little bit more, you know, especially as a new teacher getting enough books in the classroom to go along with their science units or to encourage reading at different levels. So we're close to 9 million books now, Leslie, that teachers and not-for-profits have chosen. And that's a lot of books. And, uh, 
you know, we recycle the books that are not in good shape or, you know, bindings broken or too much crayon or something like that. But um, our volunteers and our team, we go through every book that gets dropped off and uh, get them on the shelves. And we're grateful for the retired librarians and so forth, the retired teachers that help us keep the books in gorge in perfect shape. And once they're back here, they'll have a lot to do because I am not as good as, as uh, shelving the books. But um, yeah, you it's, know, it's a very remarkable thing. So we get a variety of books, you know, because we say we we say yes to every kind of book. So then we get a variety. And um, so right now in our scarcely used book and record sale, we have a sale on history books. Somebody donated um, just novels, history novels and things that aren't really like what a kid is going to read at a school library, but they're fantastic books. And so people are coming in because they see it on the book finders. And, you know, I always say we have something for everyone here. Because whether it's a book or some yarn you didn't know we had, you know, something for everyone is what we have. That's lovely. Just great. Uh, what else can I say? <laughs> um, so what is one thing you want our viewers to remember about Scarce? Well, I think we um, like to build strong communities. And that's part of the reason why we came to Addison anyway. We already had a strong connection to Addison. But when you're taking care of your, your own front yard or your own backyard, because you've learned how to do that a little bit safer, or then you've, you've learned how to pick up the five pieces of trash on your walk or clean up your neighborhood park, um, plant some better plants. You're just taking care of your community when we're helping teachers and kids. And that's just what we want to do. We want everyone to know that um, that's our main, yes, it's the environment. Yes, it's books. Yes, we have some pens and markers and all these kinds of things. But the bigger picture is we really want to have strong communities. It's better for everybody if we have a strong community for today and for tomorrow. And to do that, the environment has to be healthy. So we, we want the water to be clean and we want the air to be clean and we want the soil to be healthy. So everything that we do to to rescue resources, reduces pollution, saves, reduces the amount of energy used, reduces the amount of water wasted and so forth. So those two kind of things, they have, they go hand in hand. That's, uh, that's, that's all we can say about that. So we, we, we love what we get to do every day, Leslie, can you tell? <laughs> I can absolutely tell. And I think it's clear to anyone who's gonna watch this and I they'll love your passion. Um, so we've talked a few times, we've mentioned COVID-19 but how has it impacted the services you provide and what have you been doing differently to compensate for these changes? So, I mean, obviously we're following, you know, COVID protocols, masking, we're in separate rooms right now, so we're not masking, but um, masking, we have hand sanitizer all over the place. We're, you know, reducing our capacity even below kind of what the state is saying just for extra safety because we're kind of counting our staff and our volunteers in those numbers as well and we're, we're talking about people in a space um but when it all first started we were doing curbside so teachers would call and say you're really not open are you kidding me i really need these crayons we'd say great how many boxes of crayons do you need what do you need well put it on a cart put it outside take what you need leave what you don't want it's hard to pick out supplies for other people because they have an idea of what they know their students um, they know what they need. And so, you know, I need, you know, eight books on different dinosaurs. Uh, okay, we've got it. I don't know what you're going to want. So we put a bunch of stuff outside and they chose what they wanted. So the curbside, um, and then, you know, we do education, right? So we go into schools, or we go into churches, or we go into businesses and can't do that come March. <laughs> so we quickly learned what is Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> zoom what is this so we have some cameras and we got some more laptops and we our conference room became a studio and we got studio lights so it looks good and we learned how to do powerpoints on a touchscreen tv and um we just went in you know head first because what else are we going to do sink or swim we have to figure it out and we have to reach the people so it changed i you know leslie since we had just moved a lot of stuff was still boxed but teachers were making their dining rooms into their classrooms a year ago. Yeah. So they needed, Domtar gives us these ends of rolls of paper. And so they're huge rolls that people can, you know, cover a wall 
you know, with a couple of layers or, you know, art teachers needed stuff that they could drop off at kids' houses. So we had teachers who we were doing curbside. Then when teachers were coming inside, we would only let five in at a time and they had to stay in different rows. Um, but then they were looking for stuff for teaching at home because a lot, a lot, remember, people were told go home for two weeks. Right. So they, some school district said, don't take anything home that's not yours, you know, because you're going to be back here in two weeks. Well, then they weren't. So now how are you teaching when all your supplies are in your classroom? So we had teachers that would have one cart for teaching from home and one cart for hope when they come back and, you know, they're kind of wheeling through. And so bless their hearts, you know, that's a lot of decisions to be making. Um, Last year, they knew their kids. This year, when they started school, it was going to be new kids. So they had a relationship with the kids in March when school closed and reopened sort of in April, but now they were starting. So they needed all the stuff like, you know, welcoming black back to class. And so we have bulletin boards, retired teachers give us bulletin board supplies and um, you know, the month and the, you know, if it's raining outside or snowy, all the weather for the younger kids. So thank goodness, because they were coming and they were just making it for their classroom. And a lot of the stores weren't open. So the stores weren't open, you know, so it was, it was um, a tribute to the teachers that care about their kids. I mean, truly, um, that they found us and came and got things. You know, we don't have uh, PR money, um, marketing money, so it's word of mouth. And so thank you for telling that teacher, you know, and that we were the seventh, seventh person to tell her, but <laughs> that's really important because we can't possibly, even if we had marketing money, I don't think we'd have enough money to get it to every teacher. So thank you. Spreading the word is really important and to those not-for-profits as well. So we talked a little bit about how you've adapted, but is there anything maybe new you've adapted that you think you might continue once we kind of go back to whatever normal is going to look like? Well, I mean, the e-learning and the Zoom calls, um, you know, we're reaching different people. We do um, workshops in the evening for maybe community groups, legal women voters or library patrons. You know, you have an event at your library, but you can't have an event at your library. So we, I think we're doing Roselle Library tomorrow night. Um, And weather could be an issue. You schedule stuff in January. And you hope it doesn't have a snowstorm, but now it doesn't really matter if there's a snowstorm because the 20 people who registered are still going to come because they're just on their couch anyway. And so in some ways, and for some programs, we're reaching different people and and uh, more people than we might have reached if we had to go to an event. Because, you know, if, if the weather is bad, you might not go. But if the weather's great, you might not go because then you're like, I'm going to stay in my backyard or something like that. So we're, re- we're reaching different people. And I think um, even beyond, you know, our scope of where we've normally reached people, because um, a Zoom call, anybody can log in, you know. And so I, I think we'll keep doing that to some degree. Yeah, I think it's really hard. I, I, I love eye contact and I think all humans, homo sapiens like eye contact. <laughs> um, but I, I, we've done some workshops outside now. We did two composting workshops outside. And why not be outside to teach a composting workshop? So that has been something that uh, we didn't have the opportunity to do that in our other location. So here we can do that. And the that's a definite benefit. It's just very hometowny to be outside and do a program. We've done some kids programs outside, uh, just alongside of our building, but it's still outside. And, and I think that feels good. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's something. And I, and I do agree with Bev, the uh, e-learning and different webinars, live webinars. And I for sure didn't know what Zoom was, I gotta tell you. <laughs> but also I think we've really improved our social media. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're way better than we were a year ago on Twitter and Instagram and stuff I for sure did not know about last year. Um, and, you know, I think we ask our volunteers now, you know, if they get our Facebook or these things, you know, to help share it. You know, we ask people to share it now because, you know, everybody has their own circles of influence, as they call it. And so how do we get the word out more? So I think we'll keep some of, we're glad that we have that now as a little part of our training and learning. I can say it's definitely working for you. You were the most shared post during our small business Saturday by far. 
Really? Parties, which is like really hard to do. Wow. <laughs> you trained your group well. <laughs> I think, I think too, when you think about, you know, we have this great partnership with DuPage County. Um, we're the only county that has this kind of programs. And uh, I, think, I think that shows that, you know, working together, we can have a healthier, stronger community. So working with the school districts and working with the county and working with the cities and the libraries, you know, we've got a strong, a strong foundation to help as many people as possible and that feels really good to all of us every day well we love getting to know about scarce but now we want to know a little bit more about the two of you um what are, <laughs> what are some of your favorite spots in addison so um because of the pandemic we haven't been to too many places but um we wanted to do something, gosh, I don't even remember, maybe in the summer, we wanted to have like a staff dinner because, um, you know, we just all been working so hard to even open. We opened on June 15th and we kind of wanted to celebrate and we wanted to have a staff dinner, but we didn't really know how to do it. And so uh, I called up La Hacienda and I was like, I need catered food, but I have a couple of dietary restrictions and I got a couple of this and, and they were amazing. They did exactly what we needed. They delivered it. Um, so we've used them twice because it's amazing. And Salsa Grill is across the street. So when I forget my lunch, I play Frogger and run across the street and <laughs> get a taco. Uh, and UPS, of course, we've used them several times. You know, when we were in Glen Ellen, we had all these old phone lines. And we had a fax machine and we never used it. And then, of course, we moved here and then twice we needed a fax machine. I was like, what? So I went to the UPS store and they're very, you know what I mean? We haven't been too many places um, because of the pandemic. So, but as soon as it opens for crying out loud. Well, we have right across from the high school. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name. Uh, a teacher, Bob, a uh, science teacher who was head of the environmental club years ago. It's a park right across from Addison Trail High School. And there's a big pond there. And I was there. Addison had that big hazardous waste day. It was a Saturday in October or November. 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 And so we had over 400 cars come and that beautiful park. And I thought, wow, here's this beautiful park protecting nature. And here we are in this parking lot protecting nature. And I thought, what a great matchup. Uh, I just really enjoyed it. But the park is small. It, you know, it's not that big, but it's it's really important. Those green spaces are so important to all of us. And I thought how lucky for the high school to have it right there for their science students and just to be a calming kind of a place. So that's one of my favorite places, but I, I can't remember Bob's last name, but it was, um, it was a great project he had and he's long gone and that park is still there, you know, helping wildlife and helping the students and the community. So that's one of my favorite places. All right, so what else, what do you like to do in your spare time when you're not working? Which seems like not very often lately, but I'm sure there are some things you like to do. I was say, when? Well, you know, I said I, I could be here eight days a week. Um, so I'm here a lot, but anytime I can be with my grandkids, anytime. And so during the pandemic, my husband and I, we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary without a party because of the pandemic. <laughs> And so we thought, well, right now you can't really travel safely and we've always wanted a motorhome. So uh, instead of a party or anything like that, we uh, bought a motorhome <laughs> so that our kids and our grandkids and we can go safely, not all together, of course, but um, uh, Beverly's son is at college. And so they've gone to visit him at college and all traveled together and been able to stay together and not have to worry about sheets in a hotel or or restaurants or anything like that. Bring your own food and right and stay together. So that was um, that was something really important to us to still be able to be out safely and st be with our grandkids. That is just our number one thing that we like to do. Well, you know, I mean, family's the most important thing. So I have three kids, and um, you know, we do work in the yard and do things like that. And you know, with the pandemic, my kids were very busy prior to the pandemic. Uh, travel soccer, travel baseball, com competitive dance, like, ah, we were gone all the time. And the pen, and I loved it, except for I really love the slower pace. 
<laughs> since the pandemic. Um, you know, we have dinner together every night. Um, you know, we didn't we had dinner together a lot, but there were nights where, well, so and so's gotta go here, so and so's gotta go there. Here's the dinner, eat when you can. And now we're having dinner together every night, you know, um, we're walking the dog together. Um, so it is a slower pace this summer. You know, I imagined it was before the pandemic, it was going to be crazy because it was my son graduated high school and we were going to be getting ready for college and he was going to be off with his friends and working and blah, blah, blah. But he wasn't because he were just all home. So it was kind of like a little bonus for me. Um, so yeah, just family and a slower little pace is what I'm enjoying right now. I don't like think anyone wants to say there's like yeah, good things from a pandemic, but I think we've all found different aspects of it that we want to carry with us going forward that we can appreciate a little more. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to ask, what is your favorite book and <laughs> what are you currently reading? <laughs> well, one of my favorite kids books um, is the first story of the Boxcar Children. I was not a very good reader when I was in grade school, a little bit dyslexic and who knows. So I don't know if they knew about dyslexia way back then, but little something was hard for me. And so the boxcar kids in fourth grade reading turned on. And now it's kind of funny because um, they say the boxcar children's stories were really the first STEM books, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. They were creating things. They'd go to the town dump and they'd get wheels and they'd make a wagon and you know, I think that's kind of interesting, isn't it? And then, of course, the Lorax is is a really important book, getting close for Earth Day, but Arbor Day. But right now I'm reading The Hidden Life of Trees. And it's a hard book to read because every page is, is a lot of science and there's a lot to think about because we never really thought about trees communicating with each other. And trees, um, I don't know if you've read it, Leslie, but it's um, that trees can help rescue a tree that's in stress with sending water there and so forth. Uh, uh, it's, I'm, it's an amazing book and it makes you appreciate the stuff we don't know about nature. And I think it's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about protecting nature and wildlife. We don't know all the services our plants and wildlife provide for us, uh, environmental services, system services. We, we don't want to lose anything that is helping us in so many ways. So anyway, that's the book that I'm right, reading right now. It's a, it's, it's a really thought maker. I'll tell you. <laughs> so I don't really have a favorite book. Um, as a mother of three, I've read a lot of children's books over the years. And then when my kids got to read like those classroom novels, I read those with them so we could have conversations. So I feel like I've I've read a lot of kids' books. My favorite kids' book, I don't know if you know if it's a kids' book, but um, Small Steps, it's about the polio um, crisis, vaccine, um, pandemic, whatever that was. Anyway, it's a great story. Um, it's a sad story, but it's a great story. So that's my favorite kids' book. But right now I'm reading uh, My Own Words by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And then also Dolly Parton's book, uh, The Song Teller. I, I can't stick with one book for too long because I don't know. I fall asleep. So I have to change it up. <laughs> well, Dolly Parton's book is really quite amazing since she, it's a great book. You know, people don't understand what she's done for reading and literacy, right? It's a huge book and she's really an amazing person. Everything that she has done and she's, she must be one of the kindest people in the world. Um, and she just, she has a great family history and uh, it's a great story. And every song that she's written is a story, which is why she calls herself a song teller instead of a storyteller. She's a song teller. And um, it's the easiest book to read because it is so interesting. And I, I just love it. I don't think anyone had any idea like how much she was doing like until recently. I had no clue. Like, how do I not know about this? She's just an incredible woman. So Yes, you know, and I don't know if you knew this, but they wanted to uh, erect a statue of her at the Capitol in Tennessee. And she was like, what? No, we are in the middle of a pandemic. There is a million more things you should be doing right now than making a statue of me. That's crazy. She said, no, I won't allow like it. During the election, they said, you know, they found out she'd never had a presidential medal of honor. And now President Biden yeah. said, oh, well, I'm going to fix that. Like, that's not a problem that should happen. I guess yeah. she's turned it down several that times because she didn't think she deserved it. I just think that. 
Yeah. She gave so much money, I think $25 million for the COVID vaccine. I mean, she's really an amazing person. It's a great book. Well, that's good. Yeah. I have a lot on my list now. I'm adding every time we do one of these, I just keep adding them all to the list. <laughs> all right. So if you were forced to change careers, you cannot keep your same job and you weren't limited by like necessary skills or income, what would you want to do? I would start a soup kitchen. I love to cook for people. I love it. And I would cook all day if I could. And if somebody else would do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I would cook all day and um, I, I would, I love to feed people and I, and I, it, I don't like people not having enough food. So I would cook all day. I would cook all day and I would keep people warm with soup. And that's what I would do. I would, I would have just the biggest soup kitchen and I would love to have a, we've talked about my husband. And I've talked about filling our motor home with books and as we travel around the country someday, if I sort of semi retire or something, dropping off books in little communities. And uh, I, I would just, I would just love to be able to do those two things. Well, we would still be good partners because I would be like a farmer. I would love to just live off the land and have a little stream and have a farm. And uh, I, I really have enjoyed this slower pace with the pandemic. And I think that um, I'd have to do a lot of learning because I don't really know how to be a farmer, but <laughs> <laughs> but I would love it. Well, thank you for real answers to that questions. We kept getting the, I would do my same job. I was like, well, yes, we know, but like you love your job, but we want to hear what else you would do. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say or share with the community of Addison? I, I, there's one little thing. I So, you know, when we had the grand opening or the ribbon cutting, you know, your mayor was talking about, um, the friendship village, right, uh, of Addison. And I'm telling you, we have felt so welcome. The church next door and Biofortes next door to that and the companies we've already worked with in Whole Cube or World, which is it, Bev? Whole Cube. Whole Cube. We didn't even know them and what great partners they have already been. And I just feel like it's, it's um, it feels wonderful to be appreciated and welcome in a community and already feel like you're part of it. So I, I, that might sound a little corny, but it's, it's truly how we all feel here. We feel very welcomed and we feel very, we're, we appreciate, you know, the partnerships already. And, and we, we really, we're really loving it. And I would just say for, you know, any resident of Addison, when they have questions about, um, recycling or the environment or where does this go where does that go like that's one of the things we all love here is answering the phone and being able to answer somebody's question so um you know call us because we're a resource and we're your neighbor and uh, we want to help everyone so thank you both so much for joining us today it was really our pleasure to be able to welcome you to addison and have you here and we're so excited looking forward to working with you in the future well thank you leslie thank you so much <laughs>